us to count down to Shut the Hell Up, Calvin. We're going live. <laughs> All right, guys. Welcome to another Aftermath podcast. I am one of your hosts, James Hoskins. We have Calvin to the right of me. Right here. <laughs> Over here. Camera. Uh, there, ah, there he is. Ah. <laughs> All right. Law enforcement, <laughs> law enforcement officer, Mitch. Law enforcement officer, Chloe. They'll be helping us out today. Today, we're going to be talking about LEOs, first responders, and all that world as far as it pertains to jujitsu. I'm going to do this right from the rip so Micah doesn't have to say anything to me. Henzo Gracie Clarksville, <laughs> Combat Sports and Wellness Center. If you're looking for a great place to train, family friendly environment, amazing instructors, beautiful facility. Safe training environment. If you're in the Clarksville, Montgomery County area, please come and see us. Now, I'm going to do something that we haven't done before. This podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, Dr. Tamika Duncan of Vitality Sports and Rehabilitation Center. Right here inside of Henzo Gracie Clarksville on 327 Warfield Boulevard. So, if you're an athlete or someone who needs to get some good physical therapy, come see Dr. Tamika. She is the athlete's advantage. All right, so if you need to get your recovery done, come see her. Now, back to our podcast. So, this is actually um, one of the topics I really wanted to get into. We are hoping we could get more of um, our LEOs and some of our other first responders to get into this. This is one that's near and dear to me. Um, In the military and then otherwise, I also worked as EMS and then I worked as an emergency room nurse. So, that was my background. I was a trauma nurse forever. A lot of people do not understand the seriousness of what happens at the scene, uh, of regardless of what happens, whether you're the first one to get there as a police officer or a firefighter or EMT. There's also a reason why, even if medics are called, that they want to have someone come and secure, uh, secure the perimeter. There's a lot of stuff that happens at the site. Um, and then when we get to talking to Ms. Chloe over here, she'll tell you about a little bit of things that happens in corrections and then some of the other stuff that happens out on the street. So we're going to have a broad um, perspective of what we're talking about and how we think jujitsu can help any law enforcement officer as well as any other first responder in what they're doing. All right, so we're going to kind of kick it off with intros. All right, Michelin, tell them who you are, how long you've been training, and so forth. Okay, my name is Michelin. I've been training jujitsu now for about seven years. I've been doing law enforcement work for about four years now. Uh, did three years in corrections and then one year as a cop. Good job. <laughs> hey, Chloe. Over. Tell us a little bit about this. <laughs> we got to say over. <laughs> um, my name's sure. Chloe. I've been training in jiu-jitsu for two years. Two years now. Um, I've been doing corrections for six years. So, yeah. Good job. All right, so, Chloe, how, what got you into the jiu-jitsu? What Michelin. brought you through the doors? Michelin, um, a couple of my other coworkers, they train. My supervisors train. Um, so they were like, you know, I was going through a lot of stuff at the time. Like, I was kind of going through a breakup, whatever. And I kind of needed a hobby. Um, my coworkers were like, you should try it. You should try it. I'm like, eh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to like that. And then I started, I actually started coming here with another guy. His name's Jimmy. Um and then I, me and Michelin ended up getting, like, super close. But we, we worked together, but I had never even spoke to Michelin. I seen him almost every day, but he just, he ain't speak. So after I started training, you know, we, we ended up being more cool. And I started being like, hey, are you showing up to class, showing up to class? You know, I didn't know that being a purple belt, you're late for everything. So <laughs> I'm just sitting outside of my car, like, waiting on him, like, hey, man, you said you were coming. And then, you know, I finally got that confidence to just come in on my own. So... That's how I started training. All right. So, what was it? So, you said you did this four years prior to you started training. What were some of the changes you noticed about yourself and in the environment once you started training? I will say, like, when I first started training, um, there's nothing more humbling than getting your butt kicked. You know, coming coming to a gym and thinking that you're, you're tough and you know what you got going on and you just get beat to a pulp not beat to a pulp but you get put you get put in your spot you know um i will say like it's giving me more uh it's a bug 
<laughs> it's giving me more confidence. Yeah, except for bugs. Except for bugs. I mean, hey, I don't <laughs> like bugs. Uh, it's giving me more confidence. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily start with the rah rah type stuff. You like, you know, I don't go running my mouth and talking smack the inmates and just being like, oh, hey, you know, I just kind of de-escalate situations a lot better. I communicate a lot better. You know, if there's something that needs to go there, I don't necessarily have to take it there. Um, I will say it's given me like kind of like a calmness and just a confidence about myself that I didn't have prior. That's awesome. Michelin, what got you into it? What? So, a little background on Michelin, even though he said these things. I know him for a minute. Once he got in the military, he always wanted to get into law enforcement. Um, in the merge from corrections to being a police officer, uh, what was the biggest change or, or for you? Or what do you see as far as the benefits of your jiu-jitsu training? Honestly, to me, it's just the confidence. Like, <clears throat> I could deal with stressful situations and stay calm and not, like, freak out or escalate, you know, the situation. So it's something that's, I feel like that has been really good um, for me, especially for law enforcement. Being in corrections is not very, it's not an easy job. You deal with people that are constantly trying to test you, that are trying to get, you know, make you react and do, you know, have you do certain things, step out of line. And when you're confident, you don't, you don't have to go there. You don't have to play their game. You don't, you're, you're mentally strong. So it just, whatever they say, well, however, however they come at you, you just, okay, man, just take it and, and keep it moving. Get your job done without, without having to get a reaction from, like have them getting a reaction from you. So you, do you feel that like <clears throat> jujitsu in itself or actually any kind of, you know, combat training, other than the training you got at the academy and you got, you think that jujitsu gives you, I guess like, kind of like you said, does it make you le less likely to go crazy? Like, you know, people always saying cops don't know what, right. how to calm down, how to de-escalate, they don't know how to do the proper move to right, grab right. and hold somebody. So you think that that should be a standard for training? Oh, 100%, or? 100%. Um, it's not every day that you get to uh, go hands-on with somebody, right? Right. So if you don't train and you have to go hands-on or it's escalating where you might have to go to hands-on, you're probably going to start freaking out and start doing things that you just don't know what to do. You're going to go in there. You're probably going to start, you know, adding. If you carry a baton, take out a baton. You carry a taser, to, uh, carry a taser um, or take out a taser. And when it's really unnecessary, right, you right. know, so... Being in a gym where you train constantly is going to help you dealing with those situations. Right. Like, I believe, I, I, I think that also for firefighters and EMS, I think JITS really helped because I've seen, I'm, I'm from New York, so I've seen an ambulance pull up to try to help somebody and they get swung on. You know, like, it's such a wide thing. I've seen firefighters have to restrain someone from trying to just even run into a right. building because they might have a loved one in there. So it, I think it does help. And I think that if if they took it more main, I guess mainstream for that side of the, you know, the job, I think it would stop a lot of this stuff we got going on with everybody saying, you know, they're bad, this is bad, he grabbed me like this, he right. grabbed you know, because there's, there's so many different things that they try to take out after they've already trained you to do it. Right. Then they say you can't do it. I think the only way to remove those things is to replace them with other things that make you feel safe. Right. So you can't tell me, hey, don't choke this guy. But if I let this guy go out of this choke, he's going to try to kick the shit out of me. Right. So I think if they replace it with other moves that we learn here, other positions, you know, submissions, I think it would... It would help. I just don't yeah. know why they don't. I think if every uh, agency, like, used jiu-jitsu for their self-defense training or use of force training, there would probably be a lot less um, excessive force, you know, right. because they'll be confident in what, in what they're doing, and they'll know what they're doing, and they'll know it's effective. Right. Where if you don't train, you know, you're going to do whatever you feel it takes to get control of that person, and that may just escalate the whole thing, right. Right. you know. So. Well, I think a lot of what you guys touched on is what happens. 
So we're going to start with a basic thing, the choke, okay? If you're looking at optics, and unfortunate when you look at someone who's not trained and they apply the choke hold and the person's saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And the person is holding them down in a situation where they've cut off their oxygen supply, not their blood supply. That's important. I'm going to explain that later. For a person who is trained, we understand that if I cut off the blood supply for 10 seconds, you're going to sleep, the body resets. I stop the choke, I apply the cuffs, I put you in, and I take you away. No harm, no foul. For a person who isn't trained, who stops the flow of oxygen for longer than 15 seconds, sometimes to a minute or longer, that's when you get the bad optics of death and everything else that occurs. So for people who don't understand training, who don't understand how chokes work, then they're like, we don't want you to apply a choke hold because you won't know what to do. That is a false narrative. The more you train, the more you learn, the more you understand how things happen. If I've applied a choke hold correctly, I know that I have 10 seconds in which that person will cease to fight. Once they stop fighting, I can apply cuffs, and guess what? After those 10 seconds, that person's going to, within 10 seconds, they're going <gasps> to, yep, and be back. That's the power of jujitsu. <clears throat> I know this. Why? Because I've been choked out. I wanted to see what it felt like. Choked me out. I felt like I had an eight-hour nap. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, when they were shaking my legs to help me revive, I was like, man, why are you waking me up? I thought I was at home on my couch watching <laughs> cartoons. Yeah. It was, and it and I'm be totally honest, I was very well rested afterwards. It sounds insane, but if you talk to anyone who's ever been choked out, they'll tell you afterwards it feels weird. You choked me out, but I didn't wake up tired or sore. I actually woke up like I was well rested. I felt body. The brain resets. So it's actually one of the most least harmful thing, ways you can do to someone. So it's a funny thing we say, it's the gentle art because of the tap. But honestly, if I can take your back, get the control, choke you out, I'm helping you and I'm helping them, especially from a, if you're going to say law enforcement or even a, as a first responder. Working in the emergency room, we would get combative patients, yeah, whether it was yeah. a diabetic, and a, and a lot of people don't understand this, a diabetic whose blood sugar is really low is the same as having someone that's on LSD or someone that's having a bad trip. Oh, wow, trip. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Your blood sugar gets lower than 40, you got a, com a combative patient. Oh, wow. And they don't know why. So I got to check my watch. A lot of people that didn't understand, like we'd have, you know, soldiers who go out on a road march, maybe diabetic, they got heat exhaustion, so one, they're too hot, blood sugar is low, now you've got a professional athlete, because that's what a soldier should be, yeah. that's in my ER wreaking havoc. And I, we're trying to control this person. So that's that. where jujitsu came in for me. Learning how, one, not to take damage. Two, how to control this person without hurting them and putting them in a situation to where now I've got control, we can assess, and then we can further treatment. So a lot of people don't understand the real effects of what we can do, right? So when people say, oh, well, I see this, you have to experience it to understand it. And it goes back to what Chloe was saying. A lot of people don't understand that, that you get some guy, I, myself, uh, not now, but at the time when I was first learning jujitsu, I was 210 pounds, body fat of 10, worked out all the time, benching, and I had been boxing and kickboxing and and a lot of striking arts so when this 135 pound woman was like I'll take you out I was like girl I'll, I'll knock you <laughs> it won't happen trust me yeah. she's like throw a punch slip took my back choked me out I was like do it again I was like okay I might need to figure out how this works because if this little person can take my back and apply a technique that I don't like and control me using just leverage and technique this is something I need to know. Yeah, because that, that's a good thing about Jits is it, it has nothing to do with your overall gangster strength or whatever. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. Because I've seen some old older dudes, like, I mean, these dudes are old. 
if you see him in the grocery store, in my mind, I'm pushing this guy down. I'm taking his buggy. It ain't going to happen like that. Not, not if he's trained because they're calm. They're so relaxed. They don't freak out. Have you ever watched like an old school Gracie cat get in the ring, just lay there? You'd be wondering like, why is he? He's not taking no damage. He's not breathing heavy. And by the end of the match, he's got his arm raised. It's just a matter of, I guess you call it poise. They just flow. They know, you know, I think teaching that to first responders is, is I think that would be key. That's key because you keep, keep, it clears your mind. I think, you know, when you walk into a situation, you're not worried so much about him taking you down and taking you down or I got to grab this guy, grab this guy. It's more of a, he's going to sleep. He's going to fuck around and find out. And he's going to sleep too. I mean, it's it's something I think they should train more. I don't. I just don't understand why they don't. Um, well, a lot of the reason why they don't train more or they uh, departments really push for it is because uh, it's a they feel it's a liability. They don't want their officers learning how to choke people and using it in the street. You know, that's that's what the fear is really. Um, and. They don't know if they don't train, right? They don't right. know how it works. You don't have to choke someone just because you know how to choke them. Yeah. I mean, you, if you're trained individually, either way, if you are, you're an officer and you you train already, what's the difference between them training, you know, with the department, them training on their own? Exactly. Like policy is policy. If their policy says that hey, you can't use these type of techniques, then the officer should just follow that policy, you know. But they should push for every officer to at least train some type of grappling. Yes. You know, so they can get control of the suspect that they're dealing with. Um, and if you don't want your officers using chokes, that's fine. I understand that. Um, but it would be good for the officer to know how to defend the choke. True, true. Um, also, I think it would help in situations where you have people reaching for your gun, reaching for your... If you're, if you're in a roll situation, you're on your back, and you, you train... The odds of this person reaching around your hips and grabbing your piece or whatever, you've got more, you know, you know where to put your hands. Well, you know. we train specifically for that. And Michelin has um, came and assisted me on some of the classes when we we're doing our self-defense, when we're doing all those other things, especially when I know I have LEOs in the room or other first responders. First thing we think is, hey, if you and everybody's talking about chokes and stuff teaching uh, Elio how to do a takedown properly, how to get the combatant or the, um, what do you guys call them? Uh, uh, suspect, suspect. suspect. To get the suspect to the ground, right? We all see him, the videos on YouTube and everything else, and it hurts my heart every time I see six officers yeah. trying to take yeah. one suspect to the ground, Yeah. and this guy's like a buck fifty, and he's just throwing these guys around and running around and I'm not and I'm not trying to offend anybody and I'm actually be honest with you I don't really particularly care if I do if your job is to protect and serve and you can and you're a 200 plus pound guy and you don't know how to take a person to the ground and put cuffs on them you need a new job period facts facts because you can't protect me and you can't serve a warrant or you can't serve justice. You can't do anything if you can't get your hands on somebody, put them on the ground and put cuffs on them. The reason that we here offer four months of free training to LEOs is in, and first responders, firefighters, EMTs as well, is I've been to a scene and I know what happens. Get there, you put your aid bag down so you can take care of somebody and you got somebody rifling through your bag trying to find drugs trying to find narcs i've been there so i had to control that person had to hope somebody would help control the scene so that we could get a person out of a bad situation um don't know if you had that experience yet but i've been on bad scenes where the scenes have gone wrong and there was no perimeter we couldn't go you know get the patient out to transport them to the er because the scene wasn't controlled have officers trying to control people throwing punches yeah. That's now the other thing, when you talk about <clears throat> optics, to watch an officer trying to throw a fist fight with somebody, as opposed to an officer who takes a patient down, puts them on their face, slaps their arms up in a kimura, and puts that cuff on, 
That's how you silence the crowd. Well, mm-hmm. optics, you want to talk optics, not to cut you off, but how about, I know we've all seen that video years ago when the kids were swimming in the pool and the cops wanted them out. He couldn't wrestle a 14-year-old girl to the ground. He was as big as me. And she was giving him hell. She was a 14-year-old girl. He couldn't get her hands behind her back at all, which made it worse because now the crowd, to the crowd, you look like you're just beating up a little girl because you're just over her moving around frantically because you don't know where to grab and you acting crazy. You spazzed out. So, and you're yanking on her and yanking on her and you can't get this 14-year-old girl arms behind her back. That's not the job for you, sir. Because that, that's like you said, it looks terrible. But if he was able to control the situation, grab her correctly, this, that, and boom, she's cuffed, it's done. Back up, I'm taking her to the car, come get her later. But when you're on the ground so long with this child, now the crowd's gathering, all they heard in the back was this cop's beating up a girl. It's, it just looks terrible. If he was trained, that wouldn't happen like that. Yeah, and same. And I feel even for the ones in corrections, where it's one of you guys to how many? Um, anywhere from 40 to 60 inmates to myself. So listen wow. to those numbers. That's insane. One in, it's, wait, 40 to one? Yeah. You were bad, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> what? But what? How do you feel in your, in your capacity now? I feel a lot more confident. I will say that. Like, uh, I'm more, what's it called? Uh, when you're aware of your surroundings. Yeah. I'm more aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a lot more of that. Like I've, I've been, you know, we have to make rounds throughout our pods, whatever. And I've had inmates just walk up on me, and I kind of turn and they're like, "What you got going?" I'm like, "What you got going on? You're in my bubble. What, what, what you need?" And these are grown men, like big grown men, and it's, it's not. I don't care if I could get, you know, jumped, whatever. Uh, I don't let them see that. You never and. To me, like, doing jiu-jitsu, like, it's made me have more confidence in myself. So even if you might be able to whoop me, I might be able to whoop you, though. Like, exactly. you, you're going to have a run for your money trying to trying to get me. Well, you said two they things. They might get you, I, but all of them ain't going back in the pods. You got well, one of them. Yeah. <laughs> the thing you said that, that most people don't get, right? When it comes to situational awareness in your bubble, my bubble is that six-foot radius around me. Somebody enters my bubble, I turn and address them. For most predators... And most people don't think this. Predators, whether animal or male, must is, or a suspect, they want the element of surprise. When you address somebody because they're in your bubble and you're looking them in their face, that's 50% of the fight. Mm-hmm. Because now they realize you see them, that you've been identified, you're no longer a target, that now I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, what do you want to do? Right. That's enough to back someone down. Yeah. Jiu-jitsu, like I said, I'm... I've never thought of, well when I was younger I thought I was a tough guy and I fought a lot and then I realized I wasn't um, <laughs> I'm five Same. foot nothing 165 pounds I'm 50 something years old I'm very confident anywhere I go first thing I do when I walk through is for our situational awareness I see who's in the room I check the climate of the room I check, look at my exits and then I'll be real honest I scan and I try to figure out who's going to give me a problem Jiu Jitsu is like a superpower. I will tell you. That's like I look around and I'm like, I feel good. I feel confident. How do I test my superpower? I test it at least two times a day. I roll with soldiers, professional athletes. I roll with people that are 20, sometimes 30 years younger than me, and I don't take damage. I roll with people that outweigh me sometimes 60 pounds plus, and I don't take damage. That makes me feel really good about myself. Small and spicy. It's like small and spicy. <laughs> but that's a superpower that anyone can have. So I'm not harping on LEOs, and I'm surely not attacking you. But what I'm saying is this. No matter where your city is, wherever you are, there's a place where you can go and train. And the reason I say this, and I'm really adamant about it, is I know a lot of LEOs spend a lot of money on rounds, going to the range, putting holes in targets. You are training to kill. Yep. Now I want you to get this right. I also carry, so I'm not talking about weapons and if. If you ask me what's the best form of self defense, I'm gonna tell you is to have, be training with a handgun. Right? I will say that. After that, I'm gonna tell you it's jujitsu, because a lot of times I don't need to pull this. And if you're closing in on me, um, like uh, Michelin was saying, 
I'm not going to pull my taser. I'm not going to pull my gun. I'm not going to pull my baton if you're closer than 10 feet to me. Because all I'm going to do is pull it out and give it to you if I don't know how to, if I haven't trained to keep it in my hands or to work with it at a close range. Yeah. Right? So if you're going to spend that time, that kind of time and money practicing this and getting on target, why wouldn't you practice this and getting your hands on someone, taking them to the ground, controlling them, and cuffing them? I agree. When people say, you know, jujitsu is this and jujitsu is that, or I'm not talking about rolling and doing an MRI roll and trying to do a leg lock on somebody in the street. I'm talking about a double leg to a single leg, putting them on their back, getting their arm, twisting it around them because I got the advantage, putting my knee in their spine, putting cuffs on, which is all good optics. Um, it's some of the things we train. I teach cuffing techniques so that they understand that this is how you get it. This is the leverage points by putting this here and putting this here and lifting on this, trust me, they'll be more than happy to give you an arm. And it's not just me. Any other jujitsu, good jujitsu school will show you the better ways to take the, take the suspect down and cuff them. So it's all there. Um, I could talk about a whole bunch of incidents in the emergency room where even with security and the cops in there, it was still me and a couple other guys who had to come in and help take somebody down mm -hmm. because they didn't take control of the limbs. Yeah. I mean, simple things like, hey, if it's two of us, you can say, you, you're going to go left, I'm going to go right. We're going to get control of the arms, put him on his chest, and then we'll go from there. So. I feel like a lot of times, too, like with those situations, like that you see these people tussling, like groups of people tussling with these, these detainees, arrestees, inmates, whatever, is a lot of times there's a lack of communication. Everybody wants to be the, the, the hero and be like, oh, I got the cuffs, I got this. No, you need to multitask that, you know, somebody get the legs, somebody get the upper body, somebody get the left side, somebody get the right side. Like, we fail sometimes to communicate that because everybody wants to be the big person that put the cuffs on the person. So. Nobody wants to be an Indian anymore. Everybody wants to be the chief. Hey. So. Well, it goes back to drilling and preparation. So that, I, I just said that how often... I'm asking, do you guys go through scenarios of drills? Hey, if we get here and we see this, this is what we're going to do. Uh, yeah, we go through scenarios and drills, but I don't feel like we go through enough training for it to be effective. Okay, you I know? agree. Um, training eight hours a year, just check a box, that's not good enough. You're not going to... I'll say not, this. Yeah, the same thing with corrections, too. Like, we'll have... Maybe once a year we'll have like three, four hour classes. And I think like throughout the year, I'm not gonna remember that. Like we train for four hours once a year, probably six, a total of 16 hours maybe. But I'm not gonna remember any of that stuff. Like, you know, I, I, I didn't remember any of that stuff. Like all I knew was to grab, put them on the ground. Like, but now that I train, it's like, you know, I know a lot more. And I will say like, we're not allowed to use chokes. So I won't choke somebody unless I'm like, somebody's getting killed then it's okay but like it's not ne it never comes to that but even training jujitsu like i can get somebody to the ground i can lace their legs up or i can at least hold them there until help get comes you know so i will say that but training as a as as law enforcement it's not it's not it's never enough in any agency you go to any of that so because i've worked for multiple agencies and it's it's never it's never enough so Okay, so if you, a relative or family member, or just even a good friend of yours is a first responder, LEO, firefighter, uh, paramedic, four months, the first four months are on me. They always have been. It's, this isn't new. This is the part that kind of makes me upset. I've been doing this, how long, 10 years? Been doing this for 10 years. We have successfully moved four LEOs to Bluebell. That is not good stats at all. Now, if you ask me how many have signed up in the program, probably 100. They'll come, do a couple of classes in the block. And here's the other part, guys. It's not an ego check. I had one guy who came in, he trained, and he left. He's like, well, everybody's trying to beat me because I'm a cop. Nobody knows your... A officer because you're in a gi. <laughs> you're no, I'm I'm yeah. saying it's not a joke. Like the only one who knows it is you. 
So that's your ego. Everyone checks their ego at the door. You have to in jujitsu. I don't care how Billy Badass you think you are. There's somebody in that room that's going to humble you. There's a 17 year old kid that's here who keeps everybody in check. All right? <laughs> For real. <laughs> All right? For some people, like, there's another. Like, I could. There's about 10 to 12. Probably more than that. There's somebody for everybody in here that will keep you humble. All right? Facts. That's one of the great things I love about jujitsu. If your head starts to get too big, trust me. Somebody somebody's going to pop the, right? somebody yeah. gonna Some, yeah. Somebody's going to pop the bubble for you. Somebody get right? on that top. But that's a great thing. That humility is what will keep you alive. That humility is what will keep you safe. That humility is what will keep you training to get better in your craft. And that's what we like. That's what I want. I had an experience where I had a young LEO have, grab his weapon, going to draw it on me and everything else because of the conversation we were having. The fact that he felt he needed to display to me that he would, that he would use deadly force insane. to win an argument. Yeah, that's insane. Wild. That's insane. It's, I, I've told this several this story several times. I lost my mind, like, and I will be square. I'm. It's only hands of God that I'm still here right now because he touched his weapon and I wanted to touch him because all I could think is this man is threatening my life right. over nothing. Right. Yep. And he's paid to protect and serve. Yep. And he's threatening my life right now. Mm-hmm. And that's all I could think. And trust me, I saw red. And I can get on both sides of that. I can understand where he was at. If he actually knew how to throw hands or felt confident in himself, he probably wouldn't have touched his weapon. In that confidence, you can actually be able to talk to people a lot in a much more relaxed tone. Because you're like, hey, I feel fairly certain that if I need you, I can handle him. I don't have to act a certain way. So the confidence, believe it or not, leads to courtesy been a lot of times I've got still getting into altercations with people that want to talk crazy to me I'm just like hey you're good you're fine go ahead right because your, your thoughts are I don't ever want a problem but if there's a problem no problem Pretty you know much. that's fine no problem see but the thing about it is like I was in Miami with my brother we were drunk as shit walking down the street of course and <laughs> of course so you know it, it turned into a whole you know move on keep going and I was like Yo, calm down bro we're going you know he was uh, like he's mad he's on night shift he mad we drinking and he's at work not my fault you right. know what I'm saying change your job That's so he's mad mean, so he was talking crazy talking crazy so then I started talking crazy back cause I'm like the fuck like I didn't you do talk shit to me like, like that. you can't talk to me like this you know so then it turned into he was not by himself. Ooh. I swear, I, I shit you not, there was a, about seven of them just closing in, closing in. So I got, I was getting madder. Now, mind you, I'm strapped. My brother's strapped. So it doesn't going to be good for anyone. At that moment, I looked at my brother. My brother turns around because he's standing in front of me between me and the cops. Like, yo, he's just drunk, calm, you know. He turns and looks at me like, yo, it's about to go down. And I told him in Spanish, I was like, yo, they're not going to disrespect me. I'm a grown man. All he has to do is talk to me with respect. I said that to him in Spanish to my brother. Apparently, the officer in charge, obviously, he was Spanish, me in Miami. So when I said that, he said, oh, Poppy, calm down. <laughs> now I was Poppy. You know what I'm saying? Before I was Mullet Falker. Now I'm, and he was like, Poppy, calm down. Then he turns around. He's like, it's okay. It's okay. He's like, come on, Poppy. Don't be like that. So I was like, yo, what's the problem? So we had that talk, and he was like, yeah, you know, he's a rookie. He's a new guy. Yeah. He's bucked up a little bit. You got to be careful because he called us over here. We was going to get your ass. He said it straight right. up. You was going to jail tonight. If you didn't... <laughs> if you didn't and I'm thinking, damn, I'm so glad my grandma taught me Spanish. <laughs> but in that moment, that's exactly what you said. He was all, because my brother's six something. Yeah. My brother's a big ass dude. He's bigger than me. And because you're a small guy. Yeah, he big. He bigger than me, so that should help. And he's, he's jack, a little dude. You know, he's know. six two, two forty. He's a big dude. So yeah. and he got dreads. So I'm sure he looked terrifying to the rookie. 
And because he was scared, that's what happened. I, I know I'm intimidating. I'm just saying. I identify as But a we kind of talked about this earlier today. Talking about when they, some officers, instead of de-escalating, tend to escalate. Yes. What do you think that's from? Honestly, I feel like they lack confidence and they feel they have to prove themselves. That's where I think it comes from. They, they truly believe that the badge protects them, that the badge is everything, that they don't have to treat other people like human. You know, I'm not saying all officers are like that, but there's some officers that act like that, and that's not, that's not the type that you want working for your agency. You know, that's the type that you don't want to be working with on your shift because that's only going to cause problems, you know. Um, <clears throat> so that's, what I, that's where I think it comes from. I don't, yeah, and I don't agree quick, with How it. old are you, Benjamin? Me? I'm 30. Okay. So the reason I asked him that is he is 30, but he's also, a lot of people don't get He's a vet. He's been involved in firefights and some other things. And I think that's something else. Not saying you know, against other officers who don't have military experience, but to, it's it's a difference, right? Yep. When you've not been in a situation where you've actually had to take a life or you had to fight for your life, you can get these fantasies in your head of what certain things are like or what they could be. For those of us who've been in those situations, there's nothing cool about it. Like, no, you don't want to go back and do it again. Right? Yeah. You don't want to be there. And I can always tell when I'm working with a vet or somebody else, even though he's 30, I'm much older, like, but at 30, that's that maturity and that wisdom of, I'd rather we get to a point so we can talk it out than we try to fight it out and definitely don't want to shoot it out, right? The same thing when I'm training people in here, whether it's jujitsu or self-defense or striking, my thing is I'm training you to go home, right? I always tell people, I don't care if you win any gold medals or not, I want you to win the fight in the parking lot or in the bar. I want you to go home. If you're an LEO, I want you to be able to go home. If you're a firefighter, I want you to be able to go home. Paramedic, I want you to be able to go home. But if you're a civilian, I want you to be able to go home. The confidence to have courtesy, I think, is one of the things that's lacking in America. The more confident you are, it's easier to be courteous. I don't Somebody wants to cut me off in traffic, go ahead. I'm not blowing a horn and cussing you out in traffic because I don't know what you have in your car. I got my son in my car. Right. And I don't need you to turn around and lob bullets right. my way. All right? Courtesy. Respect. And the reason I'm a big proponent of jujitsu is the more you train, one, the humbling of it makes you realize, oh, I'm not as tough as I thought I was. Secondly, you find out how deceptive jujitsu is. Like, you start seeing people and be like, dang, I didn't know that girl was a killer. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. didn't know that that little dude could get his arms around me. Right. I didn't know that dick dude could move like he's moving. And then you start looking at people being like, dang, I don't want to trust, really test this on the street because I'm looking at this. Like, I always laugh. If you want to look at jujitsu as the perfect example, Mikey Musumeshi. If you don't know who he is, Google him. You look at this little guy with his glasses on and his little goofy smile and realize that he is a world-class killer. Killer. And there's a... Killer. You're probably walking around with somebody right now. Jerry, little goofy kid, 17 Jerry, years old. Jerry, I would never. <laughs> you look at Jerry... Never. Anywhere Jerry other than this jujitsu jitsu match, you'd just be like, y'all, that kid's goofy. Then you see what he can do, you'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> I don't want to yeah, ever make that kid mad. All right? I think a lot of things also is we're from a different place. We're from a different time. Like you, 50 something, I'm almost 50. When I was growing up, throw your hands, let's go. We, we threw our hands. It was, it was easier then. Now it's not that easy. Like if I took a ass whooping in 91, the only one that knew I took a ass whooping was me, him, and the people that were there. That's it. But nowadays, after the shit goes down, by the time you get home, you are viral. Everybody's seen it. Everybody knows what happened. So it, it puts this, I got to get back, got to get back. But when you don't have no skills, you, the first thing you want to do is run back, shoot. And, and it just it causes a first responder situation. So it's just, 
it's from it's a it's a the day and age we're in too. Like people don't just they don't realize you know you got to just train a little bit. You know, a hundred hours a year. It's like I think it's almost like nine nine minutes a day, but it only takes a hundred hours a year to actually become proficient at something. That's like ten minutes a day. Nobody wants to give up that ten minutes. They'd rather stand in line at Starbucks. You know, nobody wants to give up that time. Like, you know, I you know I I don't know. That's, well, everybody has it somewhere, right? Yeah. So I mean, you got to do what you got to do, and what some people just think? don't want to. I will say that's like one thing though, like. Nobody wants to give up the time. And that's, like, one of the things I kind of dealt with, like, when I first started training. <clears throat> but Michelin made a good point, and it's always, like, stuck with me. And he was, like, you know, throughout friends, breakups, losing family members, jiu-jitsu is always there. And that's one thing I constantly tell myself. Like, I don't care what I'm going through. I'm going to come train. I might I might got a whole load of stressful crap going on, but I'm going to come train. Well, I've said it on this podcast. I'm having a bad day. Do jujitsu. You sad? <laughs> do jujitsu. I can't tell you, you like mad? how many times do I came in and I look at you like get on the mat. Yeah. You'll be all right. Get on, yeah, get on the mat. Get on the mat. Get on the mat. Get on the mat. How you feel? Man, exactly. I feel mm-hmm. great. That's, yeah. that's when you talk about a release, think about it. Where can you go? Seriously, be like, I wanna F somebody up. And then you can go for ninety minutes and try and F somebody up. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> and then you get effed up. You get and Andrew, after, you get Jerry, you laughing. Christian. He's like, what just happened? I thought I was going to. I didn't. <laughs> How you feel? I feel better, though. I, because you can work through it. Yeah. Like, you can really go. Like, people's like, well, you can't go 100%. Yeah, you actually yeah, you can. can. You give it all you got. And the only thing that's going to happen is someone's going to see that energy and be like, all right, let me shut you down. Let me real put quick. him to sleep real quick. Right. He needs, right. to, he needs right. to relax. <laughs> he came here on some crazy you stuff. You need to relax, Spazzy son. pants. <laughs> I think it's important uh, that when you start training, truly, really try to make you just a part of your life. And no matter what happens in your life, never stop training. I think that. You'll see how successful you'll be in jiu-jitsu if you just make it part of your life and you work everything with jiu-jitsu included. You know, yeah. whether you got, you know, changing your jobs, whether you're going on vacation, you know, call school, see if you can train there. Just figure it out. But don't ever quit. You know, just continue to train, find a way, and no matter what happens, life's going to continue to keep going and just keep going with jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. you know yeah i'm i'm still here uh, <laughs> except if you're in florida where they got ridiculous math fi- no don't get me on that one i'm <laughs> calm down i'm calm down i want school that would remain unnamed charge me 150 dollars for a mat fee <clears throat> for one day of training yeah oh no nah. what yeah bro i'd have went in there and beat everybody up and then I left know. Not at that school. Well, I would, well, <laughs> got murked by everybody. I would <laughs> act like it. I would have still been very I, I'd have been pointing my finger on the way out. Well, it cost one hundred and fifty dollars to go in and murk them. I wasn't, I wasn't going to invest it and then maybe not win. So that's no. a whole IBJJF day, man. That's, that's a competition. A month, that's a month membership. Yeah, Damn. what are you talking about? Like, that's Jeez. a month. I can come back in for a month. I want to know what they what they what they monthly fee is. That's exactly. God. Who's, Dang. who's nah. teaching the class? All right, GSP. It wasn't. It wasn't the person <laughs> I went to see. So yeah, you're gonna oh. get one fifty. All right, uh, we got to wrap this thing up. I've actually enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I thought it was real good. And once again, not trying to offend anyone, not picking on anyone, myself. And I will say the Clark's Montgomery County area, most, I would say most of the gyms here. I can't speak for everyone have the same opinion that I do. That if you're an LEO or a first responder and you want to train, we're going to try to train you because we want you to be successful in what you're doing. All right? Period. So take advantage of it. Ask questions. Get out there and get trained. All right? Um, If you can buy rounds, (laughs) if you can buy a new Glock, if you can buy a new Smith & Wesson, you can invest in at least, especially when it's free, four months of jiu-jitsu training. Yeah, that will re- make you re- a better reiterate public that service. fact. Four months right. of free jits for all first responders. As well as we are partners with the Adopt a Cop program. So if you go through that agency, they'll pay for your membership up to Blue Belt if you get the scholarship. So we work with other other agencies to get you qualified to train. Um, 
and we'll be more than happy to help you find one. So we're going to wrap it up. Miss Chloe, any closing words, shout outs, or what else you want to say <clears throat> for your fellow people? No? Yeah. You want to encourage them to change? I thought I did. <laughs> get, your, get your butt on the back. There you go. I like it. All I'm going to say is that if you're an officer and you're not taking advantage of the programs that we offer here, um, you're doing a disservice to yourself. You owe it not only to yourself, but the community you work for. They're, they're looking up to you. They expect for you to, you know, to take control of the situation the right way, not escalate it. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. I mean, get in here, get training, and see how much better you would be at your job. Awesome. I say to all first responders, your job's already stressful enough. You shouldn't be concerned with your safety as far as defending yourself. Get somewhere, get trained, get your confidence up so you can do your job and protect us every day. So I appreciate all first responders. We appreciate all first responders here at Enzo Gracie, and we welcome all. So come on in, join the pride, get on the mat. Let's dance. Let's do it. Um, so once again, this is James, Calvin, Mish, and Chloe. Thank you guys for joining us on this I say a special edition of the Aftermath podcast as we talk about our first responders. And once again, not just LEOs, our firefighters, our paramedics, come see us, come check us out, um, get the information you need um, so that we can make you better. Because you are here to protect and serve, but you also need to be able to protect and serve yourself. Your first obligation is to yourself and your family to get home safely. Go home. All right? Thank you guys for listening.